Show of hands, how many people here like snakes? <laughs> well, what do you know? There's a few more than I thought. I thought maybe it might just be my two boys. Well, a lot of people don't care for them, even if they're the non-poisonous variety. You've heard that old saying, some of them use the only good snake's a dead snake. <clears throat> well, me, I'm okay with snakes for the most part. I don't really go looking for them, but they don't cause me to panic like spiders do. <laughs> But uh, let me ask you something. When you think of snakes, do you think much along the lines of positive attributes? Now, snakes generally, you think of, I mean, snake and sneaky are real close, and a lot of times that's kind of, in fact, a lot of people say sneaky snake. But uh, here's, here's what I'm saying. When we say someone is a snake, is that a compliment? No, no it's an insult, right? But believe it or not, we're going to learn today that snakes have some redeeming qualities. We're continuing this week in our study on the commandments of Jesus. And as you know, we've been working our way through the Gospel of Matthew. And then we're in the middle of a section here where Jesus is uh, sending out the 12 apostles. They're going to do a little bit of on-the-job training, so to speak. And uh, he's given them a bunch of instructions here in the first part of Matthew chapter 10. And uh, he's getting them ready for the experience of ministry, for the experience of taking the good news of the gospel of the kingdom, the good news about Jesus to others throughout the country. And in the first few verses, he told them what to take. He told them who to go to. Uh, he talks about how they're supposed to go and how they're supposed to interact with people that they encounter. Turn, if you will, to Matthew 10. We're going to start about verse 11. And read through 16. Matthew 10, 11 through 16. It said, In whatever town or village you enter, find out who's worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. And as you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, then shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or you leave that town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Well, the first thing we find Jesus is telling them here is what? Some people are going to accept the message, and some people are not. Newsflash. Not everyone wants to hear about Jesus. You know, I don't know about you, but uh, I remember when I first got saved, I wanted to go tell everyone, hey, have you heard about Jesus? Have you heard about Jesus? And... Uh, in fact, I always remember uh, Harold Morris wrote a book called Twice Pardoned. And it's the fact that he got uh, put in jail for being the driver during a robbery in which the other two guys killed the clerk they were robbing the store at, and he got pinned with the murder, and they got off free for testifying against him. So he had life in prison. While he was in prison, he found Christ. And so he ran up to this guy that he knew was a practicing homosexual, and he said, do you know about Jesus? Let me tell you about him. And he opened his Bible, and he was trying to find John 3.16, but he was such a new Christian that he couldn't find it. And the guy took it away from him and said, here, let me show you what you're looking for. And he, the guy led him through the plan of salvation, through Romans and so on and so forth. And he says, how do you know all this? He said, I'm a son of a pastor. Now get out of my face. You see, not everyone wants to hear about Jesus. And that's what Jesus is telling here. And by the way, the reason they call, Harold called it twice pardon is even though it was, uh, he was sentenced for life imprisonment, he received a pardon from the governor and he was able to get out of prison and, and create a prison ministry for uh, troubled uh, youth and young adults. Twice pardon. But at any rate, so Jesus is saying here, not everyone wants to hear about me or the fact that the kingdom of heaven is here. Some don't believe they need a Savior. They don't think they've been bad enough to go to hell. 
or else they think they've been good enough to somehow get into heaven. Some, in fact a lot that Brenda and I have run into, have been burned by so-called Christian efforts. And they don't want anything to do with anyone that has anything remotely connected to Christianity or that name Jesus. Well, it could be they don't want to hear about Jesus because they're religious and think somehow that's the ticket rather than actually placing your personal faith in Christ. I remember folks said, well, I've been going to church my whole life. Yeah, but have you ever met Jesus? Or maybe the reason they don't want to hear about Jesus is because they're Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, or whatever, and their confidence is in that religion, so they aren't interested in Jesus. But whatever the reason... The fact of the matter is that today, just like in Jesus' day, some don't want to hear about Jesus. And, and you can imagine the consternation or the bewilderment that might have been on the disciples' mind and possibly showed in their face when he tells them this. Because what have they seen him doing? What did we learn last week? He went into the whole country doing what? I'm sorry? Yeah, he did healing, he did miracles. Not just a few people, what did we learn? To everyone. He didn't leave anybody behind. He healed everybody. You can imagine the excitement. And he, what did he tell them earlier in this chapter? He said, by the way, uh, what's that, verse 1, he says, uh, he sent them out and gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Jesus has already told them, this stuff you've seen me doing, you go do it now. Like, yeah, let's go do it, let's go do it. He's like, time out, wait a minute. You're going to go into some of these towns and they're not going to want to hear what you've got to say. And he gave them some instruction. He said, when that happens... Shake the dust off your feet. Don't cling, let any of that town cling to you. There's a whole different sermon series right there. So he's given them instruction. Some people are not going to want to accept this message. So what's the answer? He says, work with those who do want to hear and don't work with those who don't. It's really pretty simple. We also need to keep in mind the fact that for those who don't want Jesus, God's judgment is waiting for them. If you go to verse 15, what did Jesus say about those they shook off their feet at? Whether it was the house or the town, it said, Truly I will say unto you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Now you remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were as immoral two cities as there's ever been. I mean, it's amazing all the stuff it talks about that they were doing. And what did God do with them? He destroyed both those cities. Down to the ground. Nothing but ashes left. Not like some of the fires we see where there's little parts of structure left. This was fire and brimstone raining down from heaven. Completely obliterated it. And Jesus is saying, you know how God treated Sodom and Gomorrah? For those who refuse to hear the message of Christ, it's going to be worse for them than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. That's saying a lot. That's saying a lot. And the people who were in Sodom and Gomorrah are still going to face Judgment Day. And on Judgment Day... Jesus said it will be better for them than for those who reject the message you bring. Wow. Well, let's talk for a moment about those who do accept the good news of Jesus. These are people you can partner with to be more effective in reaching that area for Christ. These are people who not only believe the message, but as we saw in this verse here, they support the people who are bringing the message. How? He said, go stay at their home." Bless that home. Bring your peace upon that home. You see, Jesus was telling them that as they took the message, they were to stay in the houses of the people who were open to that message. 
But the point of verses 11 through 15 is that some will accept the, and the message, and some will not. And those who don't will be judged by God. But then he explains to them just how dangerous this task is going to be. As we talked about last week, he, said, he uses the analogy of sheep. Why? Because that's something that was very common in that time. For us, it might not be the same. We'd have to find a different analogy. But sure, you can, surely you can understand the fact that sheep, by and large, are dumb and they're crowd. They like being in a crowd. They don't like being alone. And wolves like to kill. Wolves are one of the few animals in the animal kingdom that kill for sport. They will actually kill and leave it and not eat it if they're not hungry. So Jesus says here, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. First we have sheep that are pretty dumb, easy prey for wolves and the like. And Jesus is saying, imagine, if you will, a sheep right out in the midst of some wolves. Matter of fact, sheep, and I'm going to stretch it a little bit. How about one sheep in the middle of a wolf family reunion? We were talking about family reunions this morning. <laughs> All the aunts and uncles and cousin wolves are there. Kind of brings new meaning to the term sacrificial lamb. Oh, wait a minute. There's another sermon. Let's go. Anyway, Jesus says, I'm sending you out into the world the same way you would send sheep out into a crowd of wolves. What's going to happen? Even if they're not hungry, they're going to kill them. So he's not saying, oh, go do these cool things. Have fun. You see, that's the problem with most of Christianity today. They're all interested in the fun part of serving God, the awesome miracles, the being saved, and there's nothing wrong with those things. But that's not the fullness of the message that Jesus brought. You know my favorite verse. Jesus said in John 16, 33, In this world you have what, church? Much tribulation. How many times have you heard that message preached in popular TV preachers? Come to Jesus. It'll be hell. But Jesus didn't stop there, did he? What's the rest of that verse? But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Jesus didn't promise to take us out of the world, but he promised to be with us as we go through the things in this world. And give us the strength and courage to carry on. To be a messenger for him. And that's exactly what he's telling us here in this passage. He said, I'm sending you out. You're going to do the great things I did. You're going to heal people. You're going to deliver people. You're going to bring the great message that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But it's not all going to be fun and games. It's not all going to be wonder at seeing people's lives restored. There's also going to be some tragedy along the way. Some people are going to say, no, I don't want you. Some, as we saw with the Apostle Paul and with others, they're not only going to not accept the message, they're going to try to kill the messenger. And this is what Jesus is telling them here. It's like sending a sheep in the middle of a wolf reunion. They're going to turn on you and try to kill you. Be prepared. Some are going to accept your message. And for those, pronounce your blessing. Stay with them. Prepare them to carry that message on. But tell them the same thing I'm telling you. It comes with a warning. So in that context, the realization that folks are not going to always like your message or even the person to whom you are referring, Jesus Christ. So in that context, can we look at the next words of Jesus here in this passage? He says, so be wise as serpents. Remember my analogy in the beginning about snakes? Here it is. Now based on Jesus' sheep and wolf analogy, I'm sure that we can then infer that we need to have wisdom and being careful and making sure we're not running ahead of God. You know, when we get excited about something, we tend to talk about it a lot. 
And we're convinced that everyone else should be just as excited as we are. And we find out instead that not only are people not as excited as we are about it, but sometimes we kind of warn our welcome out about it. Oh no, here comes that Shay again. All he wants to do is talk about Jesus. Let's go do something else. Our zeal and our excitement for Jesus needs to be tempered with wisdom and with caution. Sometimes our excitement can get us in trouble. In our desire to win people for Christ, we can say and do things that alienate people rather than draw them to Christ. Now, I'd say most of us are not guilty of this, but I have seen that happen. I've done it myself. Or it may cause us to take unnecessary chances in dangerous situations that if done properly wouldn't be so dangerous and much more effective. I think of my brother uh, Chris Beasley. He and his church went every year to New Orleans during Mardi Gras to bring the gospel. Now he could have went down there alone by himself into this very dangerous city and preached the gospel. But they used some wisdom. They went a whole busload of them and they went out by threes. One, people hung back, hung, one person hung back praying while the other two went and witnessed. So they were still close together, the power of three. One spoke while the other one was there and would fill in if necessary. Sometimes the simple things they did was stand outside a port john and hand out the uh, waterless hand cleaner. And it was amazing because as they prayed on the way down as a group and as they prayed, uh, the threesome prayed, and they just did something as simple as handing out waterless hand cleaner the convicting power of the Holy Ghost would come on people as they were coming out of a portage on, and they would kneel on their ground right there at the portage on and confess their sins. But the wisdom there of not going into what is definitely a wolf den city alone. So that so we need to be wise. But I don't think that's the only wisdom Jesus is referring to here. Let's think about this analogy a little bit more. Have you ever watched a snake and how they go to catch their prey? They're, they wait, don't they? They pick just the right spot. They look where they know the rodent or whatever it is normally comes. And they get in just the right spot where they're right within reach so that when the time is right, they jump out and they've got it. And the mouse never knew what was coming. They actively look for the optimum place and moment to strike. And just like the snake, we need to be wise in the development, delivery, and timing of our message. This means gathering information that helps you learn about the person, persons, or the city you're going to, you're trying to influence for Christ, and then approaching them in a way that you know will gain a hearing. If you're going to a, in, in our case, we found as we were dealing with some, some uh, folks from the college that, uh, again, they had already been hurt and burned out by other Christians trying to convict them on their own. They didn't want to hear about Jesus the way it's traditionally done. So how did we have to minister to them? We had to show them Jesus. We brought them over for supper. We, we loved them just as if they were our own family. And we made every opportunity to show Jesus to them, even when sometimes they would purposely. I remember one night when they were saying, I don't see the purpose in marriage. It's ridiculous. They were purposely trying to draw me out. They knew that I would, could easily strike back with Scripture and reasons why. Thank God I was able to keep my tongue because I sensed the Lord saying, this is just them trying to goad you. Keep loving them anyway. That's the way we need to be. We need to be wise in how we deal with people. You can't approach everyone the same way with the good news of Jesus. You may be able to communicate it in different ways to different people with different mindsets. You might have all the right information about Jesus, be able to spit out the plan of salvation, walk, down, walk them down the Roman road easily as anyone. That doesn't mean that that's the road they need to walk down. 
You see, you might have all the right information about Jesus, but if you can't communicate it in a way that communicates sensitivity, you will push people away, making it that much harder for them to recognize truth. Many times we have to build a relationship before we can have, as Sister brought it out, effective communication. A lot of people think that it's easy just to go in and say, hey, you need Jesus, get right with God right now. But what impacted those people for Christ? The fact that he saw what their need was and he met their need and then told them about the gospel of the kingdom. I believe there's a truth there for us as well. We need to find ways to meet the needs of the folks we come in contact with. Now maybe at times the Holy Spirit leads us and that need is to just lead them down the Roman road right at that moment. But maybe they need help with their electric bill. Maybe they just need someone to listen we need to be that person for them and be ready, be wise. Now Jesus had talked about how some people would respond to the good news of the kingdom of God and Jesus. Some would accept it and welcome them and some would reject it. So he's telling the disciples to be wise and think about how they're going to approach people and do it in a wise manner. There's another point about snakes. Did you know snakes don't have eyelids? They can't close their eyes when they sleep, can they? Another thing to think about, Jesus is telling them the fact that just like sheep's in, in the middle of wolves, and I believe that too, uh, just like snakes who keep their eyes open while they sleep, these disciples and we need to keep our eyes open regarding how we impact these people, how to deal with the response of those people who don't accept the message of the kingdom. We need to have wisdom. But let's move on to the last part of the sentence Jesus says in these verses. And that's that we're to be as innocent as doves. I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time here because this phrase pretty well speaks for itself. The issue here is what, church? One of integrity. Integrity. That's a word that's not spoken about enough. It's not practiced enough, not only in the world, but especially in the family of God. Integrity. In bringing the good news of Jesus, we need to do it in ways that are legal, ethical, and respectful. The world is no stranger to people who use the gospel for their own gain, is it? Those who bring scorn on the message of Jesus and his followers. You see, Paul addressed this in his day in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 17. He said, For we are not like so many who are peddlers of God's word. See, they had them even back then peddlers of God's word. But he said, no, we're men of sincerity, commissioned by God. In the sight of God, we speak in Christ. There's absolutely no reason here in the U.S. for people to be shady or underhanded in bringing the gospel to people. For now, at least, it's still legal to be a Christian in the United States. And believe it or not, there are a lot of people right here in our area that want to hear about Jesus. They'd be glad to hear about him. And you don't have to be sneaky about it. You can be as innocent as a dove as you bring the good news of Jesus. We need to boldly speak the message to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, but not leave a wake of dead or wounded bodies in our wake. Sadly, today I see many Christians provoking fights around our nations. We don't approach the presentation of the gospel as sheep among wolves or with the wisdom of serpents, or even the innocence of doves. Instead, we speak condemnation with anger and bitterness and hatred in our hearts. I don't believe Jesus would support many of the things that are done in the political realm by Christians in our country. I believe it does more harm for the kingdom of God than it does good. We don't see Paul or the early disciples looking for ways to pick political fights. We see them preaching and sharing the good news of forgiveness and a risen Savior. Jesus said we're to be as innocent as doves. Now the dove was the symbol of peace and holiness and purity of the Holy Spirit. Christians are to be examples of purity and of holiness. We're to be peace-loving, genuine, truthful, sincere, and good. And when Christians do not portray this spirit, they are not speaking on behalf of Christ. You see, we need to be like Stephen who prayed for those who persecuted him even as he was being stoned to death. A disciple can be as shrewd as a snake and still remain as innocent as a dove. 
Apostle Paul said in Romans 16 and verse 19, I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. But how can we hope to stay innocent of evil while living in this real world? I heard a story that illustrates the answer. One day a man took a guided tour of a coal mine. As he entered one of the dim passageways, he was startled to see a pristine, pure white flower standing out against the black earth. Amazed, he asked his guide, how can that flower blossom remain so perfectly white in this dirty, nasty coal mine? And the guide told him, he said, reach down and grab some coal dust and throw it on that flower and see for yourself. When he did, he was surprised to see the particles of coal slide right off the petals without even leaving a trace of residue. The guide explained the flower petals are so perfectly smooth the coal dust can't stick to them. Now none of us are able to be that smooth on our own. We live in a black, sinful world and some of that dirt sticks to us every day. But only through Jesus' power are we able to live a pure and sinless life. He's the one who was truly innocent. And the only way we can become innocent is to become like Jesus. Matthew 10, further on, in verses 24 through 25, Jesus explained it this way. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple to be like his teacher and a servant like his master. Now, we're more familiar with the student-teacher relationship than we are with servants and masters, but the servant of Jesus' day was often like an apprentice to his master. So the idea of a student and teacher or a servant and master were very related. As an electrician, I can tell you an apprentice electrician becomes a journeyman electrician, and a journeyman electrician someday perhaps even becomes a master electrician. In the same way, a true student of Christ will eventually become like his teacher. As we close this message, I want to read you something from the Life Application Concise New Testament Commentary. To be wary as snakes speaks of prudence or cleverness. To be harmless as doves is to be sincere and have pure intentions. Jesus' followers would need both to be prepared for the battles lay ahead. They would need to be unafraid of conflict, but also able to deal with it with integrity. That's a great summary. I guess I could have just read that. We'd have been done a long time ago. But I wanted to make sure you got your money's worth for being here today. <laughs> Let me just finish by saying this. Yes, it's true that as we seek to tell others about forgiveness of sins and our home in heaven and how it's available by putting your faith in Jesus, we're going to find all sorts of reactions that can range from excited acceptance to even violent rejection. I believe that's coming even here in this country. It's happened to the disciples and it's going to happen to you. It happened to Jesus himself after all. But if you'll take hold of the truth that with the help of God and using these tools of caution, wisdom, and tact while remaining steadfast in being Jesus in our actions, we can then go a long way in helping people find eternal life through the message that we are called to bring to them. And folks, there's nothing there's nothing more rewarding than seeing someone take that step of faith. To seeing someone being born into the family of God, it's a wonderful thing. And it makes all the other hassles that Jesus tells us about worth it. So as you pray in the coming week, ask God to give you the tools and the courage to use them while living a godly life for the sake of others and for the sake of the kingdom. May God bless you in this endeavor.